All right, welcome everyone to the first A to J Author new user webinar for 2021. I'm Jessica Frank, A to J Author's project manager. With me today on um, our staff is John Mayer, the executive director of Cali, which is A to J Author's parent organization. We have Tobias. Back, <laughs> yeah, thanks. We have Tobias Enterejo, our A to J Author's backend developer, and Mike Mitchell, our developer, our A to J developer from Batovi. So we have, Hello, everyone. We have the full A to J stack here um, to to talk with you all, and we thank you for uh, for being here. So we're going to talk to you today about two new TIGs that we're going to be working on. If you're not familiar with TIGs, that's the um, LSC's Technology Innovation Grants. Um, we partner with legal aids across the country to build new features into A to J, and we've been doing it for 16 years now. Um, and so we have two that we're working on for the next uh, year to two years. It's usually how long they run. And we're going to talk about the new features that we're adding into A to J Author under those tags and get feedback from you as our authoring community. So on our agenda today, we'll cover the two new tags, talk through our, our, our ideas on the new features, um, opening up the call for discussion or questions about each new feature. Then I'll leave time at the end for general feedback or discussion that you'd like to have about A to J author. So it'll be like Seinfeld's um, uh, Frank Costanza, the airing of grievances for Festivus. Tell us anything that you're having problems with in A to J author and we'll either brainstorm together about how we can improve it or we'll make notes about it and our team will take it back. And during our um, development meetings, we'll talk about how we can make that problem um, easier in A to J or, or get rid of that problem for you. So for the next 18 to 24 months, we're going to be working on two TIG projects where we partnered with Michigan Advocacy Program, MAP, and Atlanta Legal Aid Society to add some cool new features into A to J. So under the MAP TIG, we're also going to continue to support our existing community, auth community of authors with training, with bug support, with development support, all of the stuff um, that you expect from us, either from me or from Tobias, if you're if you're self-hosting or have backend questions, um, all of that will still be available under our MAP TIG. With our MAP project partners, we're going to be adding three major new features. So the first one I'd like to talk to you all about is um, an advanced end user functionality. So we've heard about this need for this sort of functionality for a few years now. And we've heard about it from both end users complaining through viewer feedback or feedback that you guys get uh, from, from them individually. And we've also heard about it from authors who are uh, maybe frustrated with limitations within A to J. So there are a couple of parts that we envision making up this advanced end user version of A to J author. But let's talk about those user personas first. So the first uh, user persona would be an end user who's gone through an A to J got an interview view before, say they've an started answering their questions and they're returning to complete them later, or the user could be someone that's working on their document in a clinic setting with a lawyer or a law student sitting next to them. It's someone who doesn't need the, um, who does need to see sort of the bigger picture of the interview and doesn't necessarily need it broken down into those individual bites like a normal A to J got an interview. So that's who we envision this person, this end, this advanced end user would be, either returning user or somebody who has a little bit of extra help with them along the way. The, the first functionality, the first bullet point that we see adding is the ability to restart an interview with your saved answers, which that already exists. But the addition would be the ability to return to the point in the interview in which the user left off. So say they, um, they did the save and exit on step three, page four, that's where they would restart when they reloaded their answer file and came back. Right now, the user's taken back to the beginning of the interview and they have to re-click through their saved answers to get to that same step three, page four example. We also envision the scenario where the end user comes back but wants to start over again. Either they wanna review their answers, they need to make some change, they printed out their document and realized they spelled something wrong or made the wrong answer, they wanna they want to rethink through it, they wanna take a different path, they said no to some answer and they wanna go back and say yes. So we also need to give those people a way to quickly start again at the beginning of the interview. So here's where the first uh, interactive part comes on this webinar. What is the expected behavior of the majority of returning end users? 
would you expect them to want to come to continue on from their last answered question? Or would you expect end users to want to start over again and review their answers? I ask this because it's gonna influence how we structure the interaction for the end user. We've discussed on our development side, two options. The first one being a, um, a pop-up or a page, some page that pops up when they reload their answer that asks them if they want to start over again or resume. So, you know, welcome back. We see that you're reloading, that you've been here before and you've already answered some questions. Um, do you want to start over or do you want to resume? Or the second option would um, sort of put everybody who comes back into a default ass assumption that they want to continue on where they left off. Um, and this would have them resume, but there would be some sort of start over button or, that would be accessible for them uh, at, at any point. So here's where we'd love to hear from you all. If you uh, would like to be unmuted, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Otherwise, put your comments or questions in the chat box. And uh, any of the team, feel free to jump in. Oh, we have Luigi. I got a comment. Oh. A quick one. Okay, go ahead, John. It's John. You know, I, I just realized, um, maybe this is easy. This is video games. When you play video games, you know, you, you know, unless they're like super short games, you never finish them uh, in one sitting. You know, you come back. And the video game doesn't say, do you want to start from the beginning, right? Unless, it, I mean, there is a new game button, but mostly it's load game and you just continue on from where you are. So that seems to me to be the default behavior that people are most familiar with. That's my comment. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Luigi? Yeah, that's that's a good comment. So um, there are two things that I think um, are germane to how we're using uh, it, especially on this uh, latest interview we're doing. One is um, we're building an interview that helps um, pro se litigants or SRLs with um, the new changes to the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, and that's and these fall into the discovery process. So we're noticing that people can come to us um, during one of what we're calling three different phases of discovery, right? There's some initial disclosures, there's some uh, discovery period stuff that you can do, and then there's pre-trial after the discovery period. And so we actually are telling people to come back, um, you know, if they're in one of the earlier phases to come back and um, pick up and do their second phase or third phase um, because we can give them documents during that. So um, I, I do see some cases in which, uh, depending on how your interview is structured, people may want to start over or, may, or they may want to start over from a particular point, which seems like a sophisticated thing that I'm not advocating we do. But that brings me to the, the second thing, which is um, we fairly frequently um, version our interviews so we're adding stuff um off you know learn mores and and pop-ups but also perhaps more routing and more pages and so it would be helpful to um, figure out how to let people load an old set of answers for the same interview a new version of the same interview and i know that's probably going to drive tobias nuts but um that would you know if we've rev if we've revved the interview between people in their phase one and phase two, for example, it would be helpful if all their, they can just load in all of their court information and keep going. That's all I've got. Yeah, that makes sense that um, with this, I also envisioned that sort of the, that idea that the, the legal process might take, you know, six different parts and you, you want to get, gather all of the basics, name, address, parties, you know, money at issue in the first interview and then reuse that answer set later on because the document asked for it and you don't need to retype it. And you, you can do that currently um, by reloading an answer file that doesn't match to an interview to, to that same interview or wasn't generated by that interview. So long as the variables match. Um, yeah, that's, that's right. You can test that on AJ at org. You can create a, an account and run an interview as long as it allows to save answers and, you save the answers, then change and run the run the interview with the. You can uh, save those answers into your desktop and upload it and attach it to like an older version of the interview, and it should work. Should it should load as long as as just as Jessica said, as long as the 
variable names are the same, it should work just fine. It should love the answers. Yeah, right now, of course. Yeah. I guess can start from the beginning, but yeah, it should work. Yeah, Louis, we can talk about it too if um for like further about how to implement it in yours too. Yeah, that sounds good. It just sounds like we would have to um train, you know, explain to the users how to do that. So mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if they're at a library or something, you know, at a um, a shared space that may not be as easy for them to do, but maybe some way to email be able to email yourself the answers or some other way to do it in a in a shared setting might be helpful too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have another comment from Matt um, that he agrees with John. If saved answers are detected, um, with, he would default to where users are left off, where users left off, giving them the option to restart. Um, and then a related issue is how to review or revise earlier answers. It might be hard for a user to remember all of the questions that were answered, especially, oh, if they're buttons. Yeah, agreed. Um, that we'll talk about reviewing saved answers in just a second. Um, that's on the next slide about this. So um, the next sort of part of this advanced end user functionality is the ability for end users to see um, a table of contents of their questions, of the pages. So this could either be all of the possible uh, pages in an interview or just the pages they visited, which is more like the current My Progress bar. And our idea is to uh, implement the debug panel, which if you're familiar with A2J Author in preview mode, you can open up the debug panel and see um, a list of variables and the values that are stored and the script that's running behind the scenes, sort of what's been answered, what page you've passed, um, what buttons were clicked and what logic is run. So they do, and if you're familiar with A2J Author 4, the ability to open the debug panel in just in the interview itself without being in author mode was possible, um, but that functionality doesn't exist in the current version. And so this would be adding that back, um, adding the debug panel back to the viewer for anyone to access. Um, but it would also make this space on the screen, which generally um, takes up maybe a quarter of the real estate and three quarters is the viewer itself, um, the interview with the questions. The, um, the debug panel implemented this way, we could change up the different components. So um, we don't necessarily have to have the list of variables and their values. Um, the script is probably too much to show the end users, but this space, this real estate could have interchangeable modals that, the, um, that we can either set as a default for how users interact with it, or they'd be able to set different options to see, but they um, could have a list of the questions, um, our, our feedback that we're seeking from you guys is um, how much is too much to show end users. Um, if we show them the entire list of pages, that could be um, hundreds of pages for an interview that maybe isn't relevant to them. Like um, there's lots of interviews that have complicated branching built in that isn't relevant to all the paths aren't relevant to every user and it can be confusing for them. Or do we show them everything that could could be um, answered because you know more knowledge is better? Um, what about page names? Some of y'all have some interesting ways of naming your pages, especially when you're trying to move stuff around and and take advantage of um, our alphabetical sorting. So sometimes page names are like one C A um, B three alpha, you know, and then the name of the page, which can be confusing for end users. And what about variable names? Sometimes variable ma names make sense. Yeah. Like, can I, can I say something about that before you go past it? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the problem with page names is, uh, I don't know, as a programmer, it's like the problem with naming functions or, or variables. And, um, and that's like a whole, mm -hmm. whole weird world. Um, but even the A to J guided interviews that I've created, I always start with like, oh, it's obvious. You know, I'm, I'm in the part where I'm asking about their name, so I'll name the page after the question that I'm asking you, what's your name? And then of course, some of these things require like, oh, what's your, what's your name too? Or what's your first name or what's your last name? And then, and then there's like, well, in order to ask this question, I need to like follow up with something like, you know, is this your maiden name? And I'm like, oh, what's your name? Is this your maiden name? Then it either gets really long or it gets like, oh, there's three steps here. I got to do step one, step two, step three. Then they go back and go like, oh, I'll just eliminate this and make it two steps. All I'm saying is, um, I feel like 
you this is more like you need to know the names of the chapters of the book before you start writing the book in order to get your 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 page names right or at the end of the guided interview you know when it right before you publish go back through and change all the names one last time both which are sort of author discipline things that are a little hard and i wish there was some way we could make it easier i don't know what but i'm just saying that Right now, we account for, we basically hide the page names in the My Progress bar where um, we've put it so that it says like step zero, question one, step three, question four, and it goes in the order in which they've accessed um, or seen those pages. And it gives a little bit of a, uh, a preview of what the, the question itself says, which helps the end user. Instead of having to worry about the page name, it can say, you know, question zero, step two, what, what is your name? It takes the text of the question. Um, for the most part, that works, except for when um, macros are used, that can be problematic. Um, and so we, we've we talked through that with some of our partners, too, about people can, that... Can you use macros inside page names? No. You can use macros on the text of the question. So when we pull the text of the right. question in, it becomes essentially the page name for the end user. It's like the user-friendly version. Yep. Yep. All right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, again, feel free to jump in if y'all have questions or comments on this. But um, there was a question that said, can we add a filter to the value, uh, the variable value list to just show variables um, that have been answered? So um, that, yeah, that's a good idea that it would eliminate the list of, you know, 400 oh, variables yeah. potential. Great. Yeah, I like that idea. Oh, and potentially adding in a new field uh, called user friendly name that would be a new attribute for each page so that the programmer um, could have, could put in what whatever friendly name they want for that page as well. We're trying with a lot of this end user functionality or anything we're adding in A to J to not make our authors have to go back because we have um, thousands of A to J interviews that aren't always touched. Um, most of you on the call are really good about being active on your development process and, and sort of treating this as something that needs to be reviewed. But whenever we're designing this, we're also weighing this against the um, the interviews that are already out there and anything we implement in the viewer that would potentially um, expose information that authors didn't expect to be exposed, like the page name or the variable name, um, and for, for those that, that don't go back and check their interviews regularly. Okay, so another uh, author on the call has said, um, here, Matt, I'm going to unmute you because I'm, I'm not sure what context this one is. So if you can just explain, please your comment about uh, the new field for each variable. Sure, actually I think the previous uh, author identified a couple of the issues I raised, which is having a new field that's more of the user facing uh, label for that. So instead of client name first TE and, or, and all those variables, it would just be your name. Um, and uh, I also think that just sharing the variables that have already been answered um, that's one way to help uh, make it not so overwhelming. Um, page names are tricky, again, because there's a lot for two reasons. One, because we have the sequencing in there, um, and so the numbers may just be confusing. We also use shorthand. doesn't always help users. Um, also, it can, it doesn't always indicate what variables and all the questions that are asked on a page. So if you're if you're just using the page names for your table of contents or to find where uh, questions are or variables are, that might not get you all the way there. Um, but I realize this is this can be tough, especially for the longer interviews. You you, you probably want to have some kind of structure to help, so you, people don't just see a list of 50 variables they've mm -hmm. answered. But um, I'm not quite sure what the the sweet spot is. So those are, yeah, a number of things that yeah. I was bringing up. Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, we also have feedback asking about editing values from the variable value list live. So if they, um, if we do show the end users a list of the variables of that they've already answered, can they go back and make their changes um, just right in that spot? The only uh, issue I see with that is if there is logic that's based on the value of a variable that branches them down path one, and then you know they're 90% of the way down path one and they change their answer, which would have changed that fork way back up at the beginning, the path they would have taken. 
how do we reconcile that? Because it can, you know, if they said that they are married and then go back and like, well, I'm not actually, you know, I'm separated instead. And let me just change that. But that would have taken them down a whole other series of questions. We just have to deal with the rerouting question with that one. So we'll have to think about that. The the other features we're thinking about related to advanced end user, we sort of brought up like the ability to review your answers before submitting. And so this deals with um, reconciling variable names with what's shown to the end user. We've thought about maybe using field labels instead. So if the question, you know, it's question step zero, question one, your name, what's your name? And it has first, middle, last. That makes sense. We can use those field labels and then the answers will make sense to the end user. But if it's a question like, what's your birth date? And the answer, there's just a field there and there's no va value for the label, um, it'd be harder to, to, to use that then for the end users. So those are other things we're working about, we're thinking about. Um, and then finally, with related to this, um, do we want to allow authors to designate interviews as advanced from the start? So um, the idea is that this advanced would trigger always when end users return to an interview, but do we want some interviews to just be like this from the start? So if, if it is intended to be used by a lawyer first or a, in a clinic setting, do we want to allow um, uh, this advanced functionality, whatever we add to it, to be always present, not only for returning? So that's an idea too. Great. Um, so just another thought on uh, on page names, and I was making a few notes of my own. So uh, I apologize if you actually addressed this particular thought um, a few minutes ago. Um, but rather than you know, if, if we do want to display um, like the page names to a person, or um, you know, in in context of their saved answers, or in, you know, the answers they've entered already, or any other reason, rather than dealing with the page name itself, because as as we know, those can get pretty complicated. And you know, I know. Um, you know, as an author myself, some of my page names will be like 1ZA.2, you know, and, and just uh, naming things in, in a way that they display properly in authoring, but it doesn't really matter because it's not user facing. Um, so rather than bring about the page names, um, if you wanted to maybe just break things up by step, you know, so if you're displaying these answers or the path to a user, you could just organize it as a main heading would be like step one, your information. And then underneath that would be, you know, some some individual bullet points. Um, each of those bullet points would correspond to a page, but instead of having the page name, you just have the page text. And then underneath that, you have any variables that were set or entered in that. Um, you know, then you have another bullet point for the next question with the question text itself, um, and so on. You know, then step two, case information, and then under that you have a bullet point for each for each page. Um, so just a way to display that and not worry about the page name or a friendly page name or anything like that. I like that because it would um, it keeps sort of the structure that we already have in place under the progress bar and then just adds in um, the variables. So the step name is what's giving context to the um, right to the variable names or to the variable values. Yeah, and it would kind of reveal the path through the interview as well, so they could you know kind of kind of see where they've gone, and that might be helpful for. Um, you know, debugging, or if, mm -hmm. if it's a, uh, an advocate or, you know, help desk, you know, they, they might be able to look at that and, and tell where a branch went wrong or something. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So for any of uh, this functionality that we add in, um, is it something that we uh, should make authors affirmatively take advantage of? So if you want this advanced end user functionality in your interviews, you have to go in and, um, you know, check that that like check a box that says like you know add this or um you have to go through and affirmative affirmatively add those um friendly page names if we if we go with the page name route you have to affirmatively make the val the variable names um something that's user understandable or is this something that we should try to work as much as possible to build into the back end and account for authors not touching their interviews uh for a while even if it's uh maybe a slightly less beneficial experience to the end user. Like how, how much do you guys think author in uh, active involvement is important versus us implementing uh, things without having to, to have that interaction with the with author touching the interview again? Uh, this is Brett. Am I still unmuted? Yeah, you're good. I would definitely, 
un unless we could guarantee and it's like absolutely 100% backward compatible, which I mean, you've got, you know, 100 different authors in 95 different ways of, of, of doing things. Um, I think it would probably be wise to, to lean towards uh, having this as like an, an opt in feature. Mm -hmm. So if you don't do anything to your interview, um, any of these changes, any of these advancements, um, enhancements moving forward aren't going to affect your interview because um, maybe you did something funky or maybe maybe you designed an interview and it actually wouldn't be beneficial for the user to have some of those features. So I I think having this as a, a deliberate choice on a per interview basis would be the way to go. At least that's my thought, uh, just, you know, kind of kind of off the hip. Yeah, it seems that um, others in the chat are uh, agreeing with you or that it depends on the feature necessarily. So, um, okay, thank you for that feedback, everyone. Finally, the um, the last option that we're thinking of for the uh, this advanced end user functionality is the option to run interviews without avatars. So similar to the mobile version of A to J author of the viewer, um, you would not the end user would not see the avatars. There wouldn't be the courthouse. Um, it would be uh, stripped down into just sort of the question text on the screen. And we're thinking about this one because not everybody loves the avatars, even though they are, um, you know, my my third child here, um, and I love them. But we understand that <laughs> not everyone has has that flavor. Oh, um, don't kill the avatars! Not kill, just give different options. They still live there, but you you know they don't have to live there full time with you. They're like grandchildren at that point. Um, so this also would give more real estate to uh, have additional questions per text uh, or on the screen. So we've had um, project partner meetings where our partners have said that it would be really great if they could ask multiple questions per screen or that um, we would they would be able to gather more than just the one, you know, your address, but you could ask the name and then instead of having to click continue and then answer your address and click continue and answer your phone number and click continue and answer your email. Um, for the end user, it would just be scrolling until they hit some sort of branch or forking point in the interview. Um, and then they'd have to make, you know, the decision of are you the petitioner or are you the respondent? Um, are there thoughts on uh, additional real estate or the ability to not have avatars um, in your interview? Any thoughts on that? I see that some would like the option to not have the avatars. It's okay. I won't take it personally. Let's see. The second new feature, so out of the end user functionality, the second new feature that we'd have um, for, would be component sharing. So this, the, what we're going to talk about next, wouldn't be implemented until... Um, the later half of this year and early next year would be when it would roll out, but this is the next big thing that we'd be working on. Um, so you all are already sharing your interviews versus via email, or if um, you see an interview you like, you go to the LHI, Law Help Interactive's developer portal, you pull it down, um, you're on the listservs, like, hey, how do you do this? And people share their interviews so that the community sharing is already happening. And... Secondly, most many of the organizations um, that you all are a part of are starting to create standard introduction or disclaimer screens or standardized chunks of questions across your whole catalog of interviews. So you always start your interview with these four screens. You always ask for um, the user's uh, name implemented this way with these variables, with this logic. Um, and it's, it's really great to see that across your whole catalog of interviews. Um, the idea behind this component sharing would be that you'd be able to uh, click uh, like a button. So you have your list of pages. You click a button that says something like duplicate selected pages. Up along the side would pop a list of checkboxes. So you could select which pages you want to duplicate. Um, and when you check them, it would uh, it would select them all. And then something would pop up that says, um, do you want to click? Do you want to add to an existing interview? So you could add that to an interview you already have from your My Interviews list. Or do you want to make a new interview? And all the duplicates would then be added to a default blank interview. The idea is that it would bring over everything. So it's going to bring over the page name, the page text, all the variables that are in that page, learn more, any pop-ups, any links, any logic. You're getting everything that's coming over when you duplicate um, and move to a different interview. 
part of the um, thing that we're thinking of or that we need to reconcile is what about if the variable, uh, there's a conflict between page names from the interview you brought it from to the interview you're bringing it into? Um, what about conflicts with variables? There would be some cleanup for authors to do um, for consistency and that we'd have to um, run tests to make sure that there aren't any um, conflicts in the back end or the author would have to reconcile those. So that is the second idea. Let's see, <laughs> yes to duplication and that uh, authors would would like this for templates as well. Okay, so that's a good point to be able to bring over uh, chunks of templates or the templates themselves into new in interviews. So we haven't really thought about that. So thank you for the feedback. And it seems to be positive in the chat that you're, you're um, all for the component sharing, even if you have to do some author cleanup. So that's that's good to hear. And the next idea that we have uh, with the MAP team, the final MAP uh, TIG Enhancement Michigan Advocacy Program, is collaborative authoring. So this is the idea that um, authors would be allowed to work on the same interview and um, you would have separate user accounts. So you're not you're not sharing a password, you're not sharing an account, it would be your own account and your colleague's own account or whatever, and that authors would be grouped by the organization you're in and you can work on interviews within your org group. So um, I believe on LHI, you're grouped by state um, and you're allowed to access and upload and change any of the interviews that are in your state group. This would be similar um, and it also helps with, we're envisioning this helping when developers leave organizations that um, their boss or somebody else in their organization in their group can take over that work. And there isn't any institutional knowledge that is um, abandoned or, or locked in somebody's account um, that you can't access to because we're seeing, we've seen over time that, you know, Joe worked on this, Joe left the organization, all the local files were on Joe's computer. Now, how do I get a copy of the old A to J4 to, to convert it to the new version? So um, this collaborative authoring is how we're envisioning that. And we're also envisioning this being used in law school settings when a group of students work on a singular interview or a group of um, developers in a single organization all work on different parts. I've heard from the team at Aleo that, that I believe you would do some work like this or the Michigan teams have um, uh, sort of team author. It's not just a single developer, it's, it's a group. So um, if you have any feedback on your must haves or your biggest wishes for working on guided interviews within your development team or anything that you wish was implemented to make the process smoother for you when you're working on authoring as a team, we'd love to hear it too. Oh, and the, so uh, Brett's idea was to give authors the ability to grant another author edit access to a particular interview. Um, that's a great idea. Yeah, we've, we've thought about um, like when a file is on a shared drive, how you have read-only access or um, you have edit access to it. Um, those are all sort of things that we're thinking about related to collaborative authoring. The next project that to talk about um, that's sort of this, the Atlanta TIG is running simultaneously with the map of the Michigan TIG. Um, so we're also working, we're going to be working on making the A to J DAT output accessible. So we finished a TIG last year with uh, Legal Aid of North Carolina to make the A to J viewer WCAG AAA compliant. WCAG, W-C-A-G, are the web content accessibility guidelines and AAA is the highest level of compliance. So we've spent the last year, 2019 and 2020, optimizing the A to J viewer for use with screen readers, adjusting colors for colorblindness and contrast, um, adding in a whole bunch of other backend features and forward facing ones as well. Um, I'm happy to talk about all of the viewer related changes that we made, but if you're interested in that process, we did a webinar in, I believe it was April of 2018 that covered our plans and we, we pretty um, closely stuck to those. So that's available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash A to J author. Um, but if you're interested in the specifics, reach out to me. The ones for this new TIG will be two parts. So we have text templates, so that would, uh, and PDF templates in the A to J DAT, the document assembly tool. 
both output as PDF, but they start differently. So text templates um, start as like a blank document that you add elements to, and then it produces a PDF. We would have an in-between uh, thing for end users where they would get an HTML preview page that screen readers can read. So the end user would see their document before it actually became a PDF, which is what um, we understand works best for screen readers. And then with documents that start as PDFs, there are um, a lot of tips from Adobe and those who work with PDFs on how to best style and best practices for making those underlying PDFs more accessible. And that's what we'll be um, creating like a style guide of best practices for making the underlying PDF accessible as much as possible, because those can be difficult for screen readers to uh, work their way through. Before I move on to the general airing of grievances, um, one question I have for all of you is, um, if do you have a pool of testers or ideas on how we can connect with end users? So we can reach out to all of you, like authors, and we have, we're on listservs, and we have relationships with authors, or so, with the authors, but we're disjointed from the end users themselves. So we get some end user feedback through our feedback form, but we don't have a pool of end users that we know or interact with regularly. So if you have any ideas on, um, on connecting with the end user to show them and get them to test these new features out, um, we'd love to hear it. One of the ideas that came up uh, yesterday in a project partner meeting was adding a line or a question to the A to J viewer feedback form that asks users either to affirmatively join our pool of testers. Um, you know, they, they're already including their email, but um, there can be like a checkbox that says, yes, add me to the list of testers. I'd love to help you, something like that. Or asks them to test something specifically that we're designing right then with a clickable user test. So they, they um, fill out the feedback form, it pops up, it asks them what their feedback is, like it currently does now. But then at the bottom it says, um, you know, before you go, would you be interested in testing something out for us? And they click the link, they run through a short little usability test, and they're gone then. So we're looking for that. This is interesting. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, the community, I'm imagining that the community of self-represented litigants is, is not much of a community or they don't think of themselves as a community, you know, um, and, and so a little hard to get at, but through, through, that, through that feedback form, that's a great idea. Now, the, the community that we can get to is law students. And so um, it, it's, an, it's an imperfect thing because a law, you know, a, a college, you know, a graduate level person isn't the same sort of a persona as a, as, as, as a typical self-represented litigant, but, but maybe we can overcome the, that limitation with sort of like quantity of feedback. Um, I can imagine creating sort of a user group slash club, you know, a group of willing volunteers that we could, that we could uh, go to and say, you know, we need some law students to run through these interviews and, um, you know, comment on or suggest or, you know, uh, what's the word, stress test them. Um, and, and keep that going throughout, throughout you know, on a permanent basis with people coming in and leaving all the time, but there's always a pool of sort of a mechanical Turk-like thing in mm -hmm. Amazon, right? You know, a pool of four or five who will always uh, heat the call and, and, and pound through an interview uh, to help us out for, 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 for whatever sort of credit. We can give them a certificate if they do five of them. We could send them a, a gift card if they do 10, send them a Cali t-shirt, you know, things like that. Yeah, we um, we talked about having like general usability testing, too, because you can always, um, you know, pay for some usability or um, Mike has talked about, but Toby has access to a usability tool or a pool of testers. But it's sort of a unique user group here, especially for the advanced end user functionality, because we we want people who are familiar with A to J guided interviews. It's not just random person. It's person in a legal situation. So that's sort of like that niche market that, I, that I'm not 100% sure law students would hit, especially for the um, like uh, plain language and readability and that fifth grade reading level sort of target that we're, we're aiming for. But, okay. Yeah, I know. But, I'm, but, I, but, you know, let's not let perfect be the enemy of good enough in some mm -hmm. ways. I mean, 
I'll bet you get most of the value of feedback from from any sort of um, breathing sentient entity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, with the with the perfect being the person who is actually in that situation. Um, but, mm -hmm. You know, good enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, comment from Luigi that the, one of their tasks this year is to build a group of end user testers across Texas. So that would be interesting. I'd love to hear uh, sort of how you're recruiting or um, especially how you're doing it virtually, because I know the I've heard um, Angela Tripp and the Michigan team talk about how they go out to parades or public events or farmers markets and they set up a table and they, you know, give people a, a five dollar gift certificate to run through some sort of testing, but COVID and <laughs> that that's not available now as an option. Um, so I'll be interested to hear about how that goes. Yeah, that's classic. What do they call that? There's a, there's even a name for that. Um, uh, gorilla, that's right. Gorilla mm -hmm. user testing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we are, uh, I want to be respectful of your hour uh, of time. So I want to, um, with the remaining time we have, I'm happy to open up a general discussion of A to J author. We've, put out what we think the priorities are for um, fixing or, or improving A to J author for the future. But we'd love to hear from you on what's hard to use, what drives you crazy when you're authoring. Um, if something, does something take too many clicks? Like it's, you can do it, it works, but it takes, you know, six extra clicks that you don't need. Um, is there something that requires a workaround that's really a pain that um, you'd love to have fixed? Is there some sort of blocker to your process, if you don't pick A to J author for all of your authoring tool or for all of your automating, why do you pick another tool? What could we do to to make A to J author the first choice always for your interview automation? So this is sort of open um, open up for any of you. If you want to talk, feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Um, otherwise, you can put it in the question box and I'll try and keep an eye on that. Go to meeting question box not ideal, but um, see one that says better support for translations. Okay, that makes sense. And Andrea, I saw that you had a question about uh, conditionals uh, in the template. I'm going to unmute you if you want to explain that one better. Um, if not, I'll, I'll uh, follow up with you later. But you are unmuted now. You're just self self muted. You want to follow up on that one? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so usually in our interviews, we just happen to have a bunch of conditional boxes, you know, the if else in the templates. Mm -hmm. And we happen to have a bunch of them. So whenever we say, okay, you know what, I want this one to go at the very top, but we already have like 25 of them already built. The one that we add goes to the very bottom. So I know that we have the function to drag that box to the top, but it takes forever and sometimes it doesn't even drag it. So I was just thinking, you know, like uh, if you guys end up adding some sort of function to that, it would be nice to have at least like a little box at the bottom where you have the number that you want that box to be. Like, you know, you have one, two, three, mm -hmm. and it goes. Um, I think it will be helpful instead of having the dragon function because it doesn't work. Okay, that makes sense. We had um, an issue, I don't know, Mike, if you remember, of um, where the boxes would, uh, you'd be dragging them and then it would turn gray and it would like get all confused. Um, and I know yeah. we talked about um, implementing like, you know, box one of seven, you know, and then you can change the one to two and it would flip it around. Yes. Yeah. So that's definitely, right. I know there's a, I think, there, I think there's an issue in the queue for that, but I'll double These check. These are just to ask, this is Mike the dev. Uh, this is the conditionals within a single text template or multiple templates that you're moving around. Um. These are like, well, we have multiple templates, right? But I'm talking about like in the single template, like if I go into into a different template um, okay. and, you know, we have multiple uh, if houses or conditional boxes, um, it just, it won't drag it. It won't drag the box and it's just, it aggravates it sometimes. Yeah, currently there is a feature that if you, if you know the box you want to move and you double click it to get it in edit mode. Mm-hmm. Next to the little drag icon in the lower left, there's an up down arrow indicator that has um, will tell you its place in the list. It, it's probably indexed like an array. So you might have a zero, which would be the top one, and then one, two, three, four, five. And you can actually trigger those up down arrows to move it one space at a time. It's not 
Um, it's a little, um, I don't know, tedious maybe to do, do 10 jumps if you're moving something pretty far, but it is safer. It, it um, will actually move it one space up or down at a time uh, and not get confused by a, a weird drag drop situation. Yeah, I end up using the arrows instead, but, you know, like, uh, we have a lot of conditional boxes in here. Yeah, so. yeah I, I, I don't think it's active now, but I had the idea where if you knew you wanted it to be, you know, the second conditional, you could double click or click on the number itself and just make it two, and then the whole list would auto uh, reorganize itself around um, that that replacement. So I think that's a possibility too. The the drag drop is a little difficult um, with making it accurate. So mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out ways to make it easy to move things around without ne not necessarily using a drag and drop uh, interface. Okay. Thank you for that suggestion. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, another one that came up would be to make templates, that templates would be more useful if there were conditionals in loops. Yep, we've um, sort of the um, enhancing all things related to conditions and particularly enhancing all things related to the DAT are also sort of um, the work, we're working on it. We're, con we're continually trying to add small little bits um, the problem sometimes we run into is uh, we have TIGs for these these other projects and um, we have to sort of put other feature enhancements to the side until we get additional funding. But um, I agree that the DAT could use some more love in terms of um, how powerful it can be and that specifically logic could use some more love as well. Are there any other um, things you guys want to bring up or talk about or that we could help? Um, oh, here's another question. Um, as part of our work, do we expect to update our dependencies to the newest versions and or better supported subunits? Mike or Tobias? Sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. As part of your work, do you expect to update your dependencies to newest versions and or better supported subunits? Uh, meaning the packages that the software is built on? Yes. Yeah, we, we generally do that um, as we're able. Um, sometimes there are breaking changes between those packages going from one to the next, but I know for the front end code, um, we actually, I think Tobias, you set up, um, there's a kind of automated notification that lets us know when packages update um, and NPM now actually gives you a warning if something is as known issues or security problems. Yeah, um, I mean, is there a package you're especially specifically concerned about? I mean, what's, I mean, yeah, we do update as we go, um, but yeah, things break sometimes, so we have to test that. So, is there a specific package that's blocking you, or I mean, well, really, that shouldn't really be an issue. You should this is they're all uh, kind of. Uh, all of these pieces of the viewer, the data, the author, they're all kind of standalone packages. So, um, uh, I can, Luigi, if you want, I can unmute you. Um, yeah, okay, I'll unmute you. The answer is you're self muted now. Oh, I think you're unmuted now. Okay, I think I got it. There you go. Thanks. Yeah, this came up in the context of um, looking at what it would take to deploy our own uh, instance of the DAT and noticing that the, you know, for example, the the text template rendering engine is, I think it was like based around an old, it's an old implementation, it's based around WebKit that's no longer supported. I mean, kind of little things. And as, uh, um, as Mike said, you know, when you run NPM and you see, uh, you know, just some of the packages in there are, um, you know, behind. And so wondering what sort of, whether part of, of this, uh, the work that you're doing now is going to kind of bring those up to, you know, up to code or whatever, right? Uh, well, so the WebKit, I mean, that's probably referring to a WK HTML PDF. I mean, that's just the, the, the package. I mean, I've, I've explored looking into to moving into Chrome. That's probably not going to happen 
within <laughs> this year. I mean, uh, because the WKHL PDF right now, it's uh, it does it does work and it is a maintained it's a maintained library and and yeah, WebKit is is what they use, but I mean, so but the the actual package, yeah, the the actual actual package that project is still pretty active, so um, and it's very 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 reliable and it's it, it's it still seems to be the most featureful um, uh, solution to what we're trying to do. Um, like there's some there's still some tiny things with like headless Chrome that seem to not be added, and of course it would still need to be tested, right? So um, who knows what what will change. Um, and as for the other packages, yeah, again, it's like, that's just, uh, yeah, we did just have to go, you have to update that as you go. Um, but, but in terms of like, if you're concerned like anything like, uh, security issues, like any of the, like, for everything that I've investigated, like there's nothing in there that, that it ex would expose like your server. Like if you actually look, dig into like any of the CVEs, it's like it's just nothing that's exploitable in the DAT. It's like like the the libraries do have issues, but like it's nothing that in the normal operation of the DAT, like you can't because it's so simple, right? We're it's just doing a simple post to a custom um, to a custom route. It's it's like nothing. You can't really be exposed to anything like that. So everything else is like a lack of features or outdated features. So. Thank you, though, um, for bringing up Luigi. We, um, if there, for anyone, if there are specific concerns or issues or um, things, we are open to uh, talking to you about it. Um, if it's in the tech weeds, I'll send it off to Tobias, and and he's good about um, explaining it or specifically why we use it. Mike or Tobias can can um, follow up with you guys. I, don't, I haven't told them, but like part of, uh, you know, new year, you always have to have a new goal. So um, trying to be as open and transparent as possible and creating an A to J author that is really um, designed for you all specifically. Um, you know, I, I can spend all day thinking about how I would author, but um, we, we've seen that I, I don't author the same way you all author and um, you all come up with really great ideas on how to use the tool. So we want to hear from you. We want um, if something is not working right, if it's, or we're working too slow on something, if um, you think it should go in a certain way, we'd love to hear from you. So anything you all can give us in terms of feedback is really helpful. Um, even if it uh, seems like you're, you're sending us a lot of emails or, um, you know, it's nitpicky, like we want, we want to know about it to make it better for you guys. And it helps us also get, um, additional funding to continue to help you if there shows that there's an active community that is engaged with us, which you all are, and we'd love to hear from you about it and what we can we can do for you guys. Um, so on that, because we're bumping up the hour, we're happy to stick around if y'all want to keep talking. Um, but the next webinar is uh, next is March 4th at 11 a.m. Central. As always, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me and I can triage it to our different um, to Mike or Tobias on our team, figure out uh, how to resolve an issue. So uh, feel free to stay around if you want to continue talking. Otherwise, thank you all for coming. There was another question that, will you all have analytics available? Analytics are available already right now. You can request them um, within your interview under the analytics tab. Um, and so I'll just open up interview here. You go to analytics. And you click here to request your analytics, and it uh, Tobias then builds a custom segment of our analytics tool. Tobias, how long is the turnaround? Like a like a couple of days to to get it up and running. Days, a few days or so. Okay, yeah, so a few days. We're, we're working towards having having that where you don't have to request it; it's just automatic. But that's um, all, all I'll say is that's uh, that, that's on the plate. You know, yeah. And, and there's there's a lot of work to be done to uh, to 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 tool that up. Yep. So then you'll be able to see a custom report uh, for that specific interview. You do have to do it interview by interview, um, but feel free to request them for all of your interviews if you'd like. Just sorry, Tobias, if I just give you a lot of work. But, um, 
Yeah, the uh, bias is just sit around doing nothing, waiting for work. So yeah, just building analytics reports <laughs> in the background. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, thank you all for coming. I am recording this. I will get the video up uh, hopefully by the end of tomorrow, if not early next week. And um, we will see you all next month. And we really appreciate all the feedback that you gave today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, folks. Right, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.